Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. We're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, and today we thought we would talk about an interesting little island that's just off the southeast coast of America. Cuba, which is a large Caribbean island nation, in fact it's the largest island in the Caribbean, is certainly under communist rule, but it is also known for its white sandy beaches, rolling mountains, cigars, and rum. Its colorful capital, Havana, features well-preserved Spanish colonial architecture within its 16th century core. Old Havana, loomed over by the pre-revolutionary capital Tio, salsa emanates from the city's dance clubs and cabaret shows which are performed at the famed Tropicana. On the program today, we're joined by two friends of ours who took a wonderful trip down there for a few days, and they're going to be talking about what their adventures were like in Cuba. They also arranged to travel to this popular destination, and they're going to tell us more about how we can do that in case you're interested in going. The sights to see, we can talk about their economy a little bit in case you want to know what it's like to take American dollars over there and convert them down and maybe get them back again as you're on your way back to the United States. And also what it was like to have an encounter meeting with the Pope as he was visiting there at the same time. I'd like to welcome the Beyond 50 radio program, our guests, Jenny Waters and Derek Ewell. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for having us. Hello, Daniel. Gotcha. Welcome back to the program today. Now, tell us, uh, what caused you, what was it about Cuba that made you interested in going to it? Well, um, myself, I had interest in Cuba for a long time. You know, casual interest. I thought, hey, I'd like to go there someday, you know. And uh, when President Barack Obama said they were going to, open up diplomatic relations with Cuba, I said to Jenny, hey, we should go before all, all, it all changes. And uh, for, for me, I, you know, never thought about actually going to Cuba, but, you know, when anything is forbidden, it has a lot of mystique, and uh, it kind of makes you want to go there and check it out. And when I saw that uh, Beyonce had gone there a couple of years ago, I thought, well, how come she can go and I can't go? <laughs> yeah. So uh, when when the opportunity arose, you know, with it, with uh, the thaw, it it seemed like it would be an excellent time to go. And of course, for me, I was just telling Derek before we we started this uh, conversation with you that my essential reference points for Cuba were uh, Desi Arnaz and I Love Lucy, and The Godfather Part Two. So I'm a complete novice when it comes to Cuba, other than those things. Mm-hmm. Very good. Now, I know that I also have photographs in front of me, which we'll talk about in a bit now. Is going to Cuba, apparently it sounds like the doors are opening a little bit more to where it's going to be a little bit easier to access Cuba. Is that what I'm hearing? It's much easier to go. Okay. Uh, previously, you had to have uh, a license. Um, you had to go through hoops with our state department and with the Cuban government to get there. And uh, the travel uh, restrictions have eased a whole lot under the Obama administration. And from what I'm reading, they're trying to actually open the door to actual tourism, um, which I think would be awesome. The way it is now is there's 12 categories under the State Department, um, U.S. State Department, that you can travel to Cuba under. So, you you know, they're broad categories, um, people to people, education, religious activities, um, journalism, which is uh, how we traveled under the journalism visa. So basically you need to do your research and, and determine that you meet one of these 12 categories in case anyone ever asks you, and uh, you know, then take your next steps. Okay. So, But you're saying that even though there's those categories that in time those will even loosen up and it's just by sheer, I'd like to just go see it, that's, yes. it, that's pretty much how it's going to yes. be. Um, but, you know, um, it's easier, but I would say it's not easy. Okay. I would absolutely agree with that. It is not easy. Um, by far the easiest way to go, you know, which we can talk about, you know, uh, in the program is is to go with a group, with a tour guide um, who organizes tr- uh, trips and can get you there. They can get your visa and all of that. For Derek and me, we wanted to go and just have an adventure on our own and not have those group restrictions. So, and we had the opportunity to travel for Beyond 50 Radio and thought, let's go as journalists and, you know, just have an adventure. Mm-hmm. So getting the visa was, was no easy task, I will say that. No, well, that's good. I think sometimes you might be better off keeping things that way because usually when you over-tourist an area, 
it really takes that mystique out of the reason that you wanted to go in the first place. Exactly. Yeah, you you tend to run into more tourists than locals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like I was watching a documentary one time on Jamaica, and it was actually the truth about what you will really see. And so here's the Jamaica most Americans know about, and of course what you see is a lot of overweight white Americans sitting on the beach and drinking, and I'm thinking to myself, well, you can do that here in America. Exactly. You know, come on, show me something here that I really want to go do, you know, the, that adventure that you're talking about. I will say um, for sure, you know, we, we had concern. We are like, well, we better go this year before it really changes. It's, I, my, my sense is it's going to be a while before it really changes dramatically. Oh, okay, well, that's pretty grateful there. Now, I'm taking a look at some of the photographs you hear, and I noticed that the automobiles, boy, there's some beautiful ones there, that they're really a throwback of what looks like 1940s, 1950s America. Yeah, um, yes, absolutely. Well, that's uh, really when the relationship with the United States and Cuba turned sour. Um, uh, Castro took over the government after Batista left under threat, and the Eisenhower administration basically sent a diplomat to talk to Castro said, hey, you know, you're going to be in charge. We're going to talk to you, and we're going to set up some kind of relationship. But uh, Fidel said, no, we don't like you. You're, you're patriarchal. You're, you're capitalist. We're against all that. So we don't, <laughs> want to relate. we don't want to be friends with you. And then it just went downhill from there, you know, to the Kennedy administration, the Bay of Pigs, which was a you know a plan to take over Cuba by mm -hmm. force, and then of course the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so, with all of that, you know, obviously trade goes away, and we have an embargo, and yes. uh, the regular Cuban folks can't get cars, huh. and uh, so they have worked very, very hard and been very committed at holding those cars together. Yes, mm -hmm. I heard Derek say that he saw cars being held together with, what was that? Uh, Bondo. Bondo. Yep. Bondo, yeah. Yes. Bondo. <laughs> Much like a typical teenage hot rod. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny, too, because there was a time that I was talking about cigars with someone, and, some, and they had asked me, so is it true that Cuban cigars are really the best? And I said, you know, the truth about Cuban cigars is this. When some people may not know this, but a fair amount of the tobacco that goes into cigars actually comes from the United States. <laughs> wow. But I said so the funny thing about it is the reason why Cuban cigars are lauded as being so great is because of that embargo you were talking about, mm -hmm. that you just couldn't get these things. And so yeah. you know how humans are. If you can't get a hold of it, it must be valuable. It has <laughs> to be better. If, That's exactly right. If you right. can't go there, you want to go. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. So when I mean the, the the ratio of the cars, the old cars to the new cars, um, you know, I thought there would actually be more old cars. There were plenty of them, but I was a little surprised at our first cab ride through Havana at how many newer cars were there. Yes, mm -hmm. and our cab ride was in a newer car. And mm -hmm. so we we talked about that, and the cab driver explained to us that the people that work for the government actually have access to newer cars. And in Havana, about 89 to 90% of the people work for the government mm -hmm. in some way. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, would you consider Cuba at least where you were to be a relatively clean place? That's a good question. Well, uh, I would say I would compare it with uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say it's cleaner than Mexico. The sidewalks are in better condition than Mexico. Uh, so, to me, it, it seemed pretty clean. I didn't see. I, I didn't have any feeling of oh, you know, this is you know uncomfortable or grungy or, or right. anything like that. It, no. Yeah, no sense of that at all. Um, we also went to Buenos Aires, and compared to Buenos Aires, I, I would say Cuba is uh, nicer, neater, cleaner, mm -hmm. um, uh, better architecture. So, yeah, of of, of Latin American. Uh, locations, I'd say Cuba's not bad. Oh. Now, what were the people like? Would you consider them as vibrant as you tend to see in documentaries or movies, anything like that? Yeah, to me, um, um, to, I have a sense that, you know, they, they are under oppression, but they somehow have a commitment to keeping their heads up, um, living today, you know, the best they can. So that's a, a certain energy, I, I would say, I felt from the people. 
and our our first taxi driver he was you know very energetic uh he spoke english spanish and german wow and as a matter of fact his english was the best of of anyone we rode around in the car with and uh then we met a an afro cuban man on the malacone and he was smiling he was happy to see us he wanted to engage us. We were about uh, a quarter of a block away, and he started talking to us. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, he was very friendly. Um, overall, I would say they're um, very friendly. I ride in a lot of cabs here in Portland, yes, and so I have a lot of sort of cab comparisons. And the, <laughs> the cab drivers there were wonderful. Yes. Well, I, you know, Je- Jenny, it's interesting you should say that. I'd like to use cab comparisons too, and, and quite frankly. Depending on the city of the United States you are, they kind of suck actually compared to what you experience overseas. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> I remember yeah, yeah. when I was down in uh, Brazil, for instance, and my first experience in a cab, you get in and this guy just hits the gas and he was up to 75 miles an hour in no time. And I think wow. it took us three minutes to get to our destination. I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute, Mel, you really want to get us to where we want to go as quickly as you can get us there? It just blew my mind. You know, in Italy, they'll drive on sidewalks, you know. And oh, people yeah. think that New York cab drivers, I'm like, they ain't got nothing on people overseas. Was that the same experience in Cuba? Or? Well, I would say they were absolutely motivated. I didn't feel unsafe. <laughs> yeah, motivated, yeah. I didn't feel unsafe in the cabs, so, <laughs> though. Like, like they weren't taking unnecessary risks, I didn't I think. didn't feel that way either. I was yeah. just surprised at how inexpensive it was to get to where you needed to go because they were so quick about getting there. <laughs> well, you know, and it was a long drive from uh, the yes, airport to our hotel. Drive. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had an agreement that it was uh, thirty dollars, okay. and that was, you know, in in the U.S. That ride in in Portland would be probably sixty, at least, at probably. least, yeah, and maybe eighty. Yeah. 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 So you know, they were they were friendly, they were polite, they were conversational. Um, so yeah, it was a very positive experience from my point of view on that. Now I know an important thing for people who, especially, don't have the experience of traveling outside of the United States is. The currency exchange rates and, I guess, the ease with which that happens. Tell us about your experience there. Well, um, originally we were told, hey, you get to Cuba and you exchange your U.S. currency for the Cook, which is the Cuban pesos, at the airport. Get to the airport, uh, we ask to exchange our money. Our actually our cab driver, uh, he met us at the door. Someone, you know, and he walked us over to the exchange place, and we saw posted what the exchange rate was, and it was eighty-seven cents to um, the U.S. dollar for the U.S. dollar mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. for there. So we hap- happened to have some Canadian money, which has a higher exchange rate. How about that? Yeah. So we gave them the Canadian money. They exchanged it. But they gypped us. <laughs> it was, in in yeah. other words, we were supposed to. We had forty dollars of Canadian, and we were supposed to get like uh, forty-five dollars back. They gave us twenty-nine dollars because they knew we were U.S. Obviously, yes, they knew uh, we were Americans. So. I, I mean, that's our assumption anyway. Yeah. But well, with, that's actually a pretty good assumption considering how <laughs> Costa Rica is to Americans. If they discover you're American, boy, they're going to stick it to you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then, after we exchanged that, we had they sent us to another window to exchange our U.S. dollars. Yeah, they wouldn't uh, do both, so there you go. And then mm-hmm. the woman wrote down on a piece of paper what we'd get back. In, in, and, in script. And I said, hey, well, we need a receipt. Yes. So then she typed one up, and but yeah, it's yeah, you you you, you can expect to lose, and and uh, Castro set up a thing where, with this embargo with the United States, any American that comes to Cuba, we're going to tax them. Yeah. So their dollar, unlike other um, countries, mm-hmm. uh, third world countries or countries that are in development, where the U.S. dollar is stronger. Castro made it weaker. Oh. Yeah. So it, so you can expect whatever the exchange rate is plus a 10% tax yes. um, okay. that you're going to lose. And there's uh, two currencies in Cuba, the cook and the cup. And the cup is um, the Cuban peso. The cook is the Cuban convertible peso. 
and uh, the cup is worth less, but that is what most of the Cuban people use. And we didn't experience this, but we had read that sometimes when you make purchases there in Cook, they will give you change back in cup, thinking that you won't know the difference. Um, but that actually didn't happen to us, so mm-hmm. we're we're fortunate, I guess, in that the, regard. The other thing is that Castro set up is because they have the two currencies, you are marked. The moment you take out your money, they know that you're an Not American from there. or a foreigner. <laughs> yeah. You're using wow. that third that third kind of money called the cook, which they don't use themselves. Now, well, how do you get around something like that if you, you know, as as a listener out there thinking, you know, well, I don't want to be Shanghai. I don't want to enjoy myself. I don't want the corkscrews stuck to me by a dictator that's had it out for us for the last 50 years. Yeah. What, do, what do you do? Well, hmm. one of the things that we had read was to actually convert all of your money to euros or Canadian before you go to Cuba. Ah. We didn't do that. And so I don't actually know whether that works, but that that is what some people, you know, but, suggest. Well, you know, over the embargo use, years with the United States, uh, Canadians and Europeans have been going to Cuba without that relationship. Right. So you can present yourself as a Canadian or a European and, you know, get the better deal. And for sure when we did the exchange at the airport, they didn't ask, to see our visa, you know, or anything like that. So they wouldn't necessarily know if you showed up, I think, with 100% euros or 100% Canadian. Um, you know, it's possible that you might be able to avoid the 10% tax. I, I don't know. Well, um, I can say one thing is true. You know, certainly you can get a lot more Canadian money with United States money. Yes. I yes. just imagine, so you get all this Canadian money, you go down there where the exchange rate is higher for Canadian dollars. Exactly. So much for the 10% tax rate. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and then the important thing, I think, is if we, you know, when we do this again in the future, we probably wouldn't exchange all of our money up front. We might no. have just exchanged a portion of it because at the end of our trip, we wound up with, with about $500 in Cook. And we needed to exchange that. We went to the hotel uh, desk, and the hotel desk said, no, we don't have any U.S. dollars. You have to do that at the airport. We get to the airport, and the exchange person there said, no, we don't have any U.S. dollars. Oh. Yes, and so here we are with this money that will be worthless if we take it out of the country. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, there was a guy who said, U.S. dollars, one-to-one ratio. Yeah, you find plenty of those street bankers, don't you? Yeah. But he was standing right here. He was, he was right at the airport, right, right by the exchange desk. Wow. <laughs> he was right there. And so I went over there. We went over there, and we looked at his cash. He showed us the U.S. currency, and I looked at it, and I touched it. And there were $100 bills with the strip. And it seemed legitimate to me, so we exchanged. Mm. We didn't have a whole lot of choice because we certainly didn't want to take that much cook back to the U.S. Mm-hmm. So. Now, do they have ATMs or do they use credit cards or credit machines at all? Well, they have credit cards, and uh, Europeans can use credit cards, is my understanding. Okay. But uh, there's no U.S. Uh, credit cards that are used there. No. Okay. So you got to go with cash. Okay. So there you go, well, listeners. You've got to really pay attention to how it works down there. Go with Canadian or Euros because you get a higher exchange rate, and chances are you may not get taxed. And exactly. The other, the other thing I would say is, you know, if they're going to give you, try to give you $100 bills, make them break it down to 20s or less. Yes. Because if you have $100 in Cook and you hand it to the average um, Cuban, they're, they're not like, going to have change. Well, anyway, they don't deal in Cook specifically. They deal in the cup cup so now they're like ah, well, i don't know what to do with that ah gotcha <laughs> now as you were planning your trip to cuba what were some things you really felt motivated to experience there that's a great question well i wanted to just experience uh the the streets of havana um oh, yes. because it seemed like a romantic city to me and you know again that's part of the mystique and and you know going someplace that i know very little about and uh, my reference point was when we went to Buenos Aires, one of my highlights was just walking around on the street, and we wished that we could have done more of that. Um, but in that experience, we were on a, an organized tour, so they were sort of controlling our movements. 
but in Havana, I just wanted to go and I there and be on the street, and I wanted to go to the waterfront to the Malacon, and we got to do both of those things. Yes, uh, f- for me, I just wanted to uh, take the mystique out of the place, just to see for myself, you know, see it myself and have my own reference points. Mm-hmm. And um, it did not disappoint. Uh, I'm going to refer back to Buenos Aires again. You know, they call that the Paris of South America. Well, I would say Cuba is the Paris of Latin America. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that you certainly took out the mistake, Derek, if in fact uh, it was you that took a photograph of these two stray dogs on the beach. Yes. Yes. Well, the thing is, is there are a lot of stray dogs. <laughs> and we found out um, that... During, right after um, the economic collapse of the Soviet Union, the situation was so bad in Cuba that people were eating cats. It was called the special period. Mm -hmm. And we saw not one cat, not even one. Wow. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't cats there. Um, Since we came back, we decided to research it. And it turned out that they actually had a cat show in Havana where about 100 cats turned up. Yes. Um, but, you know, compared to walking around the streets of Portland where you could see cats, like, everywhere, mm-hmm. um, there were no cats, we, but a lot of stray dogs. So we saw dogs and no cats. That's fascinating there. Now, you also were there at a particular time, and this is one of those things where timing is everything, that the Pope happened to be visiting Cuba as well, and I'm looking at a couple of the photographs you have there. Boy, you were... Within handshaking distance, it looked like. Well, actually, we were. That was a long lens. We were actually ah. <laughs> at least a football f- field away when he landed. Well, I was. I was there. And I was standing in between ABC News and the Miami Herald. So that's the people I was shooting with. They had these massive lenses on cameras. I just had a, a 500 millimeter lens that I have, my most expensive lens. And uh, I was able to get that shot. You know, it was, it was hard. It was a complete coincidence. We when yep. we we scheduled our trip in February to go to Florida, and we thought, you know, doing a little bit of research, it's probably the cheapest time to go in September because there is a threat of hurricanes and yep. a whole lot of rain. So we decided, well, we'll just go then and save a little money. And about. I don't know, three weeks out from our trip, our travel agent said, uh, we're going to make your um, journalism visa that you're going to see the Pope. And I said, what? And (laughs) she said, oh, yeah, the Pope's going to be there. And Mm. so it was a complete coincidence. And so we we scheduled it to try to avoid the hurricanes, and, of course, shortly after that, a big hurricane came by. Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yes, we got to see the Derek saw the Pope land in Havana, which was a historic visit since the Pope was uh, all about uh, trying to um, I- increase the diplomacy between Cuba and the U.S. And, of course, um, you know, he wants to um, supposedly, of course, bring Catholicism more to Cuba. Sure. And it uh, turns out that Raul Castro uh, was a Jesuit, and so they have something in common, this uh, Castro and the Pope, and they seemed very friendly yes. at the airport. It was cool that Derek got to see uh, Raul Castro speak. And then the next day we saw the Pope speak to the uh, Cuban youth, which was also uh, an exciting experience. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to say this about the Pope. This uh, thawing over the relationship between the United States and Cuba, opening the diplomatic relationship, uh, this Pope was instrumental in that. Yes. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it looks like the possibility of being able to use credit cards and ATM machines is in the imminent future it's anyway. It's going up, yes. Yeah, there's definitely an increasing talk of that, and also um, with commercial airlines being able to fly into Cuba right now to get there, you uh, have to be on a charter flight, mm-hmm. and uh, those are expensive, like really expensive. Yeah, very it's expensive. A, you know, from between four and five hundred dollars round trip um, from Miami. Which is a 45-minute flight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Most expensive flight I've ever been on. Yeah. And 
you know, so the hope is that, that the Cuba will allow U.S. airlines to fly in. So there's a lot of, you know, of course, details that they have to work out to do that. We were really hoping for ferry service uh, because there is discussion about ferries between Miami and Fort Lauderdale going into Havana. Oh, okay. And there's six U.S. Uh, ferry companies that uh, the U.S. has granted licenses to to do that, but they just have to get uh, Cuba to agree. That's mm-hmm. my understanding at this point. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, obviously, when people travel, they like to get souvenirs. Uh, tell us, uh, because it seems that Cuba seems to have, you know, restrictions on a few things here. What is that like as well? Yes. Well, our souvenir pickings, I would say, were thin. We always try to buy magnets, and we went and looked for magnets, and there were like two choices, and <laughs> and not very good, you know, not really good pictures. No. So we bought a magnet. And then our next choice were T-shirts. T-shirts. <laughs> yes. So we then, went out looking for T-shirts. No salsa when, shoes or anything like that? Well, well, <laughs> that would have been even more fun, but even harder right. to get. Right. Yeah. Um, now, we our main place to buy these things, we were at the airport and our hotel. So those are, we didn't see anything on the street that specifically, you know, was targeted at. As souvenirs, right. And uh, we did buy some cigars. At the um, airport. At the airport. Ah. But the thing at the airport, it's cigars and alcohol. Those are the big the big souvenirs. Mm. Yeah. And the, the limit right now, as I understand it, is that you can bring back $400 worth of goods from Cuba if you're an American citizen, and 100 of that can be alcohol or cigars. So when you're left with uh, $500 of cook, you spend it at the airport. If you haven't gotten it changed back to the U.S. <laughs> yes. That's right. Then you come back and sell the Cuban cigars in the United States you, for exactly. 10 times what yeah, you yeah, bought them for. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Yeah, get your money back. We don't smoke, but we brought them back to my dad, who's a former smoker. So we've, we've gotten him to uh, pose with a picture of him and my mom uh, holding their Cuban cigars in their mouths. So. Yeah. Ah. Well, if you have any extra, I'll certainly buy one at cost. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, uh, what would you say is the most compelling reason for our listeners out there to even consider going to Cuba? I mean, they listen to the restrictions and this and that, but to me that's kind of the adventure of how do I get around all this and actually make it a worthwhile trip? Well, that's a that's a big question, Daniel. Well, let's just I just want to tell you We're something. adventurous here on I the program. Tell you something yeah. about about us that you wouldn't normally know. And that is we have uh, a world mark and uh membership and because of that we are able to get a reasonable place to stay in Florida uh, in the Florida you know in Miami mm-hmm. area, Fort Lauderdale actually. So to me it's it's basically get to Florida, and have enough time to make your arrangements to get to Cuba. Of course, you work on that before you get to Florida, but the main thing is to get to Florida first. Well, one of the things that was really helpful for us, we were there for a week and ahead of time, yes. and we had to go spend hours sitting in our travel agent's office in Miami. Yes. Um, while she was on the phone, she was doing this, she was doing that, and to, while we were waiting for our visas. And we didn't even know up until the day before we left that we were going to, whether we were going to have visas to go. Yes. And so if you can be in Florida a little bit ahead of time, that's very useful because there will be a lot of details to work out before you can actually get on that plane. How about and, that? Yeah, and, and, and like, I, like I said earlier, it's easier, but it's not easy to get to Cuba. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, alternatively, if you're okay with going with a group, you know, just you can do a quick Google search and there's probably, you know, not a ton of companies, but there's at least six or seven companies that regularly uh, talk about advertising their trips to Cuba, and they will arrange to get your visa for you if you're just going as a, on a people-to-people visa. Um, so oh, it's a whole lot easier oh, to do it that way. Just to, to add this to that, um, we met a woman at the visa office in Cuba who went as a Catholic representative, and she did not have her visa, and she'd been sitting there for hours, and, and we came in after her, and they, we got our visa and left, and she was still there. And she, you know, we don't know if she got a visa, but we know that she landed in Cuba and did not have one. 
Wow. Yeah. It really sounds like quite a few obstacles uh, compared yes. to the typical trip that a person takes, and you kind of wonder, you'd really have to have some motivational to want to go then. That's right. Yeah, it's That's definitely right. not a typical trip to okay. go. Um, okay. But it was interesting to me when we were in our hotel, which was the Hotel Nacional, which is a, a really lovely old hotel to stay in, which we would recommend, um, that when we were in the elevator, we would just you know randomly talk to people and say, where are you guys from? And we ended up talking to a family from Texas and a family from New York. Yep. And so, you know, we don't know, we didn't talk to them long enough to find out why they were there or how they got there. But people are definitely finding ways to get there. Very good. So you got to be very resourceful, which is certainly something that will add adventure to the trip. Yes, you have to make the commitment and, and follow through and go through the hoops. Mm-hmm. And would you say that all that was really, really worth it besides the Pope being there as sort oh, of yes. that fortuitous thing? Well, I would say it was because when we were walking on the Malacone, like I said before, we, we actually met a Cuban man who engaged us, and he went on to tell us that he tried to escape Cuba twice, uh, once when he was 12 and once when he was 18. When he was 18, he got 12 miles out in a boat, and he figured, hey, I, uh, it, it's only 90 miles, I could probably do it. But somehow he got detected, and then he he scuttled his boat to make it seem like he had an accident. Oh. So, you know, being able to go there, you can watch documentaries about Cuba, but if you go, then you, you get to go and talk to people and have one-on-one experiences and interactions. Um, well, very good. Well, it certainly sounds like it's worth it regardless of all the obstacles, but certainly that's where planning can come in play and knowing how to do the right kind of planning to get you there. Yes, absolutely. Now, we, is there a website you can suggest for our listeners to, uh, you know, sort of like the path that you guys blazed already? Um, we would be happy to send you information to put up on your website. If that okay. would be all right, I can sure. get you phone numbers and um you know, definitely list some suggestions. Um, We would say to people when we were talking about, you know, whether we would want to go back or what we would say to people is, you know, adjust your expectations. Exactly. This is not a usual trip. You're not going to be able to get on the Internet every two seconds. You're not going to be able to check your cell phone. There's, you know, I mean, we saw people with smartphones, but those were Cubans that have, you know, ability to do that within their nation. But we couldn't call home. Mm-hmm. Um, we couldn't text. We had Wi-Fi at the hotel, but it was very, very slow. Um, so, you know, it's a whole different experience, and you need to be prepared for that. So slow you couldn't watch a YouTube video. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it's a real vacation, finally. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. You, if you Escape from technology. Go yeah. to Cuba. Yeah, there you go. Boom. There you go. Yeah. I like that very much. Well, Jenny and Derek, thank you both for sharing your experience about Cuba. I'm sure our listeners are very enlightened by that, and it's nice to know that finally there's still a destination place that you just don't waltz into and do all the same things that you would be doing if you never left home. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. It was a pleasure to have both of you on the program today. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. You bet. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Again, explore and discover the right way to go about doing what you want to do when it comes to travel. We'll have more on our website about that so you can figure out what your next step is. Our website, beyond50radio.com, that is the number 50. Be sure to also sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter at beyond50radio, as well as like us on Facebook if that's your thing. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program. And remember, live your day past. Have a pleasure.